Good evening and welcome to the second season of the National Writers Series. Tonight our premier event with legendary journalist, author, the man whose voice sounds like Mount Rushmore. <laughs> the man who has been in the middle, it seems, of every major international and national event of the 20th and now the 21st century. Tom Brokaw in conversation with Doug Stanton. My name is Grant Parsons, and I'll be just giving you some welcoming uh, remarks on the uh, process tonight. And of course, I am always the one who says, one of these, you please turn off your cell phones. The series is a year-round book festival bringing the brightest literary celebrities in the United States and thousands of their readers to downtown Traverse City for great conversations about storytelling. This will be rebroadcast on IPR and Up North TV. I hope you share your appreciation with the entire team of the National Writers Series, particularly Marcia Clark, Megan Raphael, Sam Porter, Abby Walton Porter, Beth Milligan and Ann Stanton, Marcy and Bob Baranski, as well as our notable sponsors and others whose support makes this series possible. FIM Group, downtown TC's independent investment management firm headed by Paul Sutherland, one of our earliest sustaining sponsors. The Traverse City Record Eagle for its generous support for the series and its award-winning local news. Wayne and Terry Lobdell, hosts of tonight's annual fundraising dinner at the Bowers Harbor Inn's Peninsula Room. The Bia family for their continuing support. Copy Queens, friends of the Traverse Area District Library. Mark and Wendy Stackable and the generosity of Ray and Marcia Minervini. Some of our most valued sponsors are listed on the back of your program. We hope really sincerely you will take the time to say something nice to the people as you see them outside in the hallway or in the community. Tonight, our singers were the Anders and sisters, Gloria Shirley and Paulette. Morsels created the unique Tom Brokoffee, Tom Brokoffee Toffee. Sharon Webster of Dove Song Flowers decorated the stage and lobby with flowers. Sharon Scranton and Terry Hooper of Hooper Farm Market provided flowers for the reception. A number of you and your unsung heroes donated tickets to World War II veterans through your generosity, right? They're in a special part of Mr. Brokaw's life, Doug Stanton's life, and, and our life locally and nationally. And we especially acknowledge those uh, veterans who are attending tonight. I also want to acknowledge the specially made chairs and the whale tail table, which was created specially for the National Writer Series by the Artisan Gallery next door. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, please remember, after the, uh, after the uh, uh, speaking event with Tom and Doug, Mr. Brokaw's autographed, already signed books are on sale in the lobby, as well as other great books by recent uh, National Writer Series guests. Now, as for the National Writer Series, we have partnered with area businesses, libraries, schools, book clubs, and writers to make this series one of the best in the nation. On June 2, the series is proud to host a rare evening with short story and nonfiction writer Thomas Lynch. He'll be in conversation with Traverse City's own Jerry Dennis. Both are criti critically acclaimed and nationally renowned authors, and this conversation is sure to be lively, laugh out loud fun, and moving. Tickets for the June 2 event are gonna be in, uh, available on sale both at the National Writers Series website and at the box office. Future writers appearing in the next few months uh, represent a staggering class of talent here, including Audrey Nifnegger, Mario Batali, Mr. Food, James Bradley, Flags of Our Fathers, Carl Marlantes, Matterhorn, Peter Matheson, the writer, and uh, David Finkel, Pulitzer Prize winner. These series events, with your generous sponsorships and donations, support the National Writer Series Scholarship Program. The scholarship program involves 24 schools in our region and will give significant support, money and mentoring, and recognition 
to young writers headed to college. For these young writers, these series events and scholarship program are meant to entertain, to explode labels, to defy categorizations, and to nudge them toward their own voice in an enlarging world where writing skills are ever more in demand. Now, here's, this, here, here's the hardest part of my welcome. This evening, uh, there's gonna be the main event of Doug Stanton and Tom Brokaw speaking. I would reverse that order if I had to do it again, but it stands, <laughs> you know. This will be uh, Tom Brokaw and Doug Stanton will be accompanying him. <clears throat> I don't know where that can. <laughs> anyway, anyway, then after the event, there's the, the, after the event ends, there's going to be 15 minutes when all ticket holders can purchase books out in the lobby, and then we're going to clear out. We will restart with a VIP reception after that. There will be a reception for VIP ticket holders and World War II veterans who received a sponsored ticket. And if you don't know what that means, that means if you uh, are a veteran who received a sponsored ticket. At the end of this speaking part of this program in here, simply go out in the hallway and there's a table or there's somebody to talk to who's going to give you a pass for the uh, VIP reception. Back to the other page. And it's close to be the end here, being the end. All right, I am pleased, and let me, let me take a breath on this. I am pleased to start the evening by introducing my friend with the clear blue eyes. Two weeks ago, while I was thinking about fishing and morel mushrooms and dinner with my daughter, Doug Stanton was in Afghanistan. He was emailing photos of his body armor, his helmet, the Black Hawk helicopter that was flying him over Kandahar. In the Brokaw tradition, Doug goes difficult places to find meaningful stories in a world that is sometimes dangerous and oftentimes it seems impossible to understand these days. And in the Brokaw tradition, he greatly enhances our community with his experiences and his writing, which he brings back in the form of stories for us all. Please join me in welcoming New York Times bestselling author, founder of the National Writers Series, Doug Stanton. Hi, thank you. I guess I'll use this mic. Can you hear me okay? Thank you and welcome for coming. Uh, thank you and thank you for coming. Um, it's been quite a day. Um, it is, uh, without a doubt, uh, prob it is uh, the, my highest honor and greatest privilege in my professional life really to welcome Tom Brokaw here this evening to Traverse City. I'd also like to welcome the parents and the teachers and the students and the librarians and the business people and the families and the writers, and most of all, um, the World War II veterans in the audience tonight, and all the veterans for that matter. Um, if you are a veteran, could you raise your hand? Can we see some of you guys? The house lights are... There they are. They're <clears throat> I'm very glad you're here. And um, you're, and you're scattered throughout the room here. And uh, we will entertain questions. Uh, well, I won't, but you, you'll be glad to and able to answer questions and ask questions of Mr. Brokaw here in just a minute. Um, a little over a year ago, uh, the National Writers Series started at our kitchen table at home. Um, in that year, we've had tremendous growth and we've had a lot of fun and it's a lot of work. Um, I wanna thank here in the front row, the Minervinis, um, just for a moment for providing um, great lodging for our guests. What Ray and Marcia have done over at Building 50 is, uh, is, is really uh, fantastic and unbelievable. It's <laughs> Tom was remarking about it today. I mean, you've essentially uh, built another uh, downtown, uh, a couple blocks from the downtown, and someday they'll be linked, as they really already are kind of in spirit. Um, tremendous growth over there. Um, the, 
it's that kind of community partnership. And uh, you go, ask, you ask Ray, "Hey, Ray, can we do this? Can we have a frisbee tournament with uh, flying monkeys?" And he might, he go, "Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea." <laughs> when we say, we're, "We'll bring writers here, uh, and people will show up and they'll listen to them," um, uh, people said, "Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's do that." And we just went with it. And uh, and I want to really uh, thank everybody uh, who's been involved. It's our conviction that we, in this series, we, we share more of our commonalities than we do kind of identify each other along the fault lines of our ideologies. I was telling Tom earlier about my grad school story about watching two guys get into a fist fight um, about Sinclair Lewis, and uh, those were the days. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it wasn't who do you, who'd you vote for, it was do you think he's a good writer or not? That's the kind of passionate uh, energy we want to bring back to books and art and the written word. Um, the, I want to talk about now about Tom Brokaw. He's been telling stories uh, since 1962 when he began his journalism career in Omaha at the age of 22. He is the author of enormous bestsellers that have changed the face of American culture, The Greatest Generation, among them, The Greatest Generation Speaks, an album of memories, and Boom, which is about the generation that came of age in the 1960s, which happens to be Brokaw's generation. He has the singular distinction of having anchored NBC Nightly News, The Today Show, and Meet the Press. And on December 1st, 2004, after 21 years as anchor and managing editor of NBC Nightly, NBC Nightly News, he signed off for the last time speaking to nearly 16 million view viewers that's the nightly news for this Wednesday night. I'm Tom Brokaw. You'll see Brian Williams here tomorrow night, and I'll see you along the way. And he wasn't kidding. Because since leaving that post, he has been as busy as ever. During his career, he has reported on 25 documentaries covering race, politics, the environment, health, and literacy. And still he claims that in the second act of his life, he has more time to fish which is one of the passions he shares with his good friend Yvonne Chouinard, the founder of Patagonia Clothing, and novelist Tom McGuane, among others. Uh, you may note, and some of you have come up to us in the past day to say that you've seen their show on ESPN called, ESPN called The Pirates of the Flats. It's, a, it's really probably the best fishing show that's ever been on television. Um, along the way, Brokaw has reported from Somalia, Beirut, Baghdad, China, and South Africa. He has won every major award a journalist can win, interviewed every figure of consequence of the 20th century and 21st century, including every president since Lyndon Johnson, and he's covered every election since 1968. His reporting during the 2000 election with Tim Russert was stunning, lucid, and historic, and his coverage of the attacks of 9-11 riveted the world. I sat at home and watched, like all of us, as Tom Brokaw made sense of a world in the throes of change and uncertainty. He, it's interesting because he seems easily at home in the world, or rather in many different worlds. And it's his genius that he has been able to make these seem united, more united than they are different. And it's safe to say that, of course, he is America's most trusted storyteller. And yet during all of this, he has remained very much the man who left Yankton, South Dakota, who found his way through the world through the lens of journalism and by means of an intense, patient, and empathic interest in other people's lives. As he writes in his fascinating autobiography, A Long Way From Home, the world in which I work and live is a long way from home, but the early bearings I took as a child on the prairie surrounded by working people and the communities they established, often in difficult circumstances, have been a steadying and reassuring presence. They are familiar events of markers and sentinels, useful and reliable even now, 40 years after I left the land and people that launched me. We are honored to have him here to talk tonight about the art of storytelling as we launch the National Writers Series Scholarship Program. And just as a note, as Grant said, beginning tonight, we officially now are accepting applications from juniors and seniors in a five-county area through July 28th. And go to our website for more of that information. But we've now opened the door. 
it's our job as parents and it's your job as students in the audience to step through it and we'll help you on that journey. I was helped by a similar grant. Oh. I had a similar grant when I was a teenager in Traverse City uh, and it meant the world to me and I've never forgotten that act of generosity actually. The truth is <clears throat> that this uh, book festival and this scholarship program, and Mr. Brokaw doesn't know this, but they're really inspired by his own example of service to others and his pursuit of bringing stories to life. And I mean this quite literally. Almost nine years ago, I was about to publish a book I didn't think anyone would read called In Harm's Way which is about a U, uh, World War II ship, uh, the USS Indianapolis. I was at home, oh, thank you. <laughs> I was at home and the phone rang and it was my friend, Dave Scrappo. Dude, he said, turn on Larry King. Tom Brokaw is talking about your book. And I was confused because I had no idea why Tom Brokaw, whom I'd never met, and whom I didn't even know had a copy of my book, uh, why he would be talking about it. Dave, I said, have you been drinking? <laughs> yes, he said, <laughs> but he's still really talking about your book. I turned on the TV and there he was, paying a compliment to that book but even more important, he was paying homage to the men who story I was honored to tell. And it was that act of generosity uh, that brought enormous attention to the stories of those men and really helped launch even further their ordeal into the American consciousness. <clears throat> On another level, it was perhaps the kindest thing anyone had ever done for me professionally, and it, it literally changed the course of my life. I decided then that if I had a choice, and I realized that I did, that in my own writing and whatever advantages it offered me, that I would try to leave more on the table than I took. And however my, imperfect my attempts, I would be aware that the men and women I write about are the ones who've done the hard work of living, of having survived whatever ordeal they've lived through, and that my job is simply to be the teller through whom their stories pass. In this challenge, I heard echoes of the stories of the veterans I'd met, and I've heard it since from veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. And I also heard echoes of my own parents' voices. Be patient, listen, and no matter how little you have, you have enough to give someone else something. The writer series is dedicated to this spirit of support, and I imagine right now there is someone walking down Front Street who's wondering how in the world they're going to make a living as a writer or even what to write next. And if we've done our job here correctly in this room tonight, and when we leave here, perhaps we can be part of answering uh, that challenge. On the other hand, we're lucky enough because no one has been more encouraging to others in this journey than tonight's guest, Mr. Tom Brokaw. Please welcome him now. Thank you. <laughs> Please. Thank you. Thank you. That's very generous. Thank you. Thank you very much. The fact is, Doug, whenever you go on Larry King, it helps to be drinking. <laughs> so. Authors love Larry King, and I have, I'm very fond of him personally. But Larry's been doing it for so long, and he does it so often during the week, that sometimes his attention flags when you're on the air. <laughs> so you find yourself out there able to say anything that you want to <laughs> about your book. You can engage in high praise for your work. You can pick out what part of the question you want to answer. And Larry sometimes just kind of checks out. And then occasionally, he decides that he ought to make a show of getting back involved in the interview. 
So one night I was on Larry King talking about the greatest generation and World War II and telling I was in the middle of a very poignant and moving story. And I could see that Larry was going to come back to again <laughs> midway through the story. So I kind of steeled myself. And he leaned over and he said, Tom, Tom, just a minute. World War II. <laughs> I said, yes, Larry. He said, that was a really big deal, wasn't it? <laughs> and I said, I, I can't disagree, Larry. So you, you could have talked about books I hadn't written. <laughs> Let me take a minute or two and tell you how I came to write The Greatest Generation, and then I will uh, undergo the withering cross-examination of your fellow citizen. Um, I was born in 1940. Uh, so my first memories of life are of World War II. We were living on an army base. And my first conscious memory is about people going to war, guy next door, young guy who was in high school, and he would play with me and entertain me, and then he was in uniform and he was going to war. Just across the street were two Sioux Americans, native Sioux, who were heavily decorated in the European theater, and they came home on leave. And uh, as they deserve to, they got roaring drunk for a couple of days. And everybody up and down the street just said, leave them alone, they're going back. And there were trucks being driven by women. I can still see to this day a woman getting out of a big 8 by 10 truck with a bandana, wearing a pair of overalls and carrying a lunchbox. And that was my first impression about women being able to do things other than what they were expected to do in those days, which was to stay at home and clean and, and do the cooking. Uh, we were at an ordnance depot, so they were exploding ordnance, ammunition, and bombs out in the southwestern South Dakota prairie every day. It was like having your own uh, homegrown fireworks show. And I thought the war would go on forever because that's all I had ever known. I wore a, a helmet to class, and I ran up and down the ditches and fought the Japanese and the Germans, uh, the imaginary enemies coming over the prairie, and then suddenly it was over. And I moved to the central part of South Dakota in a very remote area on the edge of an Indian reservation where my father went to work for the Corps of Engineers, and they were building big flood control dams and hydroelectric dams in those days in the middle of nowhere. And because of the can-do spirit of World War II and what they learned to do in short notice, they would build a town seemingly overnight. They would literally build a town within two years, a whole town. It would look like an army base. It would have paved streets and curb and gutter and a movie theater and a hospital and a hotel and a very good high school and a shopping center and then a lot of government housing. And we had the best house we'd ever had. It was uh, one half of a duplex with three bedrooms, one bathroom. And my parents just couldn't believe their good fortune. My dad was making a pretty good wage. And uh, we had all these opportunities surrounding us because we were in the boom time of the 1950s. And from all over America, workers came. And they were able to buy their first new car and buy something called a deep freeze and to have running water and to have indoor toilets. Many of them had never had that before. And they were making good wages. And they were able to buy their children real Christmas presents and not have hand-me-downs. So there was this almost palpable sense of optimism and of celebration of the goodness of American life, and we began to take it for granted. And, you know, I caught uh, the good wave and, and married a wonderful woman. In 1962, we went off to Omaha, to Atlanta, to Los Angeles, and, and before too long, I was making five times as much as my father had ever made, and I was able to travel the world. And, I ended up in Washington, and then I'm the White House correspondent, and going to the White House State Interviews. Now I'm in New York, and uh, first I did the Today Show, and then I was the anchor of Nightly News. And in 1984, we decided that we should do the 40th anniversary of D-Day, Normandy. And I was a pretty keen student of American military history, so I said, absolutely, let's do that. And I was also thinking, with the other side of my brain, man, this is going to be great. I'm going to be in Normandy for a week eating great French food, drinking good wines and Calvados, <laughs> and running through the countryside. And I went, and we had lined up a representative group of veterans, uh, two guys from the Big Red One, the First Division, a couple of guys from uh, the 82nd Airborne, a military chaplain, 
and one of the rangers from the 2nd Battalion, one of the boys at Punta Hawk, that took the cliffs. And we met them for dinner the night before, and they just seemed like everybody who'd ever raised me. I, mean, I was just so familiar with all of them. They looked like the guys that I knew at the American Legion Club or at the Vets Club, and I thought, boy, this is going to be a piece of cake. And I walked down the beach the next morning, Omaha Beach, with the two guys from the 1st Division, one of them who later earned the Medal of Honor, and the other one who later lost his legs in the Battle of the Bulge. And as we stepped onto the beach, I looked over and saw their wives. They were clutching their handbags. They had kind of plastic headdresses pulled down tight like everybody I'd ever known growing up. They'd got new permanents the night before. <laughs> and the men were wearing their American Legion windbreakers. And I said, tell me what happened. And they stopped. And they lowered their voices. And they began to describe the horror, June 6, 1944. They were 19 years old. And when the ramp went down on their Higgins boat in the first wave, their lieutenant and their first sergeant were shot dead before they hit the water. Now these guys were on their own. They rushed ashore as best they could, threw themselves down on the sand in a state of stark terror, and couldn't move. And one of them, Gino Murray, said, but there was a 34-year-old colonel who came loping down the beach like in a morning jog and said, come on, boys, we've got to move forward. We can't win the war here. We've got to keep going. And he said, that gave us enough courage to go to that bluff. And one turned to the other and said, do you remember what was going on there? And he said, I, I'll never forget it. And I said, what was that? And they said, well, that bluff had been laced with landmines and a sapper unit had gone advance to detonate them and to mark the trails. Given the chaos of the moment, many of them had stepped on the landmines, shattered their legs or their arms. They just simply rolled off to the side, shot themselves up with morphine, took a cigarette break, and instructed us to come on and told us, walk there, don't walk there, walk there, don't walk there. And when we got to that top of the bluff, about noon, we thought we'd live this day. And we knew that from then on in our lives, we would live it one day at a time. And they fought every day for the next year. Well, by then, in the first 90 minutes of filming, my life had been changed. And I realized how much we owed those two men and the millions of others who had shown such great courage in European theater, North Africa, the beaches of the Pacific, the skies, on the seas and beneath them. And I went back a kind of shaken person, and then I heard Bud Lamel's story, one of the boys at Punta Hawk. Then I heard from the 82nd Airborne, and by the end of the week, I went home and said to my wife, my God, we have no appreciation of all that our parents went through and their friends went through. And I began to collect the stories, not quite knowing what I was going to do with them. I began calling the parents of high school friends, and coaches, and men that I'd known growing up, remembering that they'd been in the war and had them tell me their stories. And I began to use them in commencement addresses, keeping notes. By the 50th anniversary, 10 years later, that was a memorable time when Ronald Reagan stood on the cliff and talked about the boys at Punta Hawk, and at that point he was talking about my friend Bud Lamell. I was going on the Today Show, and I thought a little bit about what I wanted to say, and I said out loud to Katie Couric, you know, this generation, in their formative years, went through the Great Depression, when life was all about sacrifice, common cause, and deprivation, and going without. And then, just as they got into their late teens or early 20s, they were asked to go to the far reaches of the Pacific and into the bitter cold of Europe, into the burning sands of North Africa, and fight these two monstrous military machines. And we were not really prepared to get into that war. 1940, the United States was the 16th military power in the world. We had more horses than we had troops. <clears throat> And then I said, you know, Katie, they came home and they could have put down their weapons and gone back 
to their hometowns and said, I've done my share, but they didn't. They went to college in record numbers, they got married in record numbers, they built new industries and gave us new science and new art, and they never stopped giving back. I believe, I said, it's the greatest generation any society has ever produced. And when I finished, I thought, kind of wonder if I've gone too far. And I was unhooking my microphone, and Stephen Ambrose was pounding me on the back, saying, if you don't write that, I will. <laughs> <laughs> the greatest generation. That's the phrase. And I said, well, I've been thinking about it. So I proceeded to collect more stories and put it in book form. And my publisher had some reservations about the title, The Greatest Generation. God, are you going too far? Can we market that? Is that something that's defensible? And in a meeting with the publisher at the time, I came up with a phrase that I've continued to use. I looked at her and I said, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Had Ambrose published Band of Brothers yet? Pardon me? Had Ambrose published Band of Brothers by this? Uh, Band of Brothers came out uh, about the same time. Uh, Band of Brothers came out a little bit after. This all came out in 1998. Um, I was finishing this book. Unknown to me, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks were making Saving Private Ryan. So in August, Steven called me and said, I'd known him. He said, I'd like you to go to a screening of a new film. And I went, and it began, and I looked at Meredith and I said, oh my God, there's simultaneity here that no one could have anticipated. But Band of Brothers came out a little bit after that, as I remember. Um, and no one knew what to expect. I, I wrote it in about a year and a half because I was working on something else, and this book was just continuing to press me. And I went to the publisher and said, I want to change, and I outlined what I wanted to write, The Greatest Generation, and they said, stop everything and go write that. It came out in time for Christmas of 1998. I had never written a book before. I didn't know what to expect. And there had been a lot of chaos along the way. My editor's husband had died midway through the book, and so I've lost her. Um, and, I, you know, I was finding my way through this new process. But a couple of friends of mine who had written books uh, stepped in, read the galleys, came back to me and said, there are a couple of things that you need to clean up here, but by the way, it's going to be a bestseller. I said, how do you know? They said, just trust me. So it hit the bookstores in December, and as Doug knows, that's a terrifying moment for an author. You know, you've poured your life into something. Are people going to respond? And I was telling Doug earlier today that it was selling at the rate of one every 90 seconds for a long time, and it stayed on the bestseller list at number one from December of that year well into the spring, um, more than six months. This is not as immodest as it sounds because my most heartfelt belief about my role in this book is that I was a doorman. I opened a door and said, there are stories here that we all need to hear, and America was ready to hear them. And the, Veterans, for the first time, were ready to talk about them. Did it change your reporting pre, pre Greatest Generation, post? I mean, did you did you start asking different questions about Americans you met in general, having gone through that transformative experience on the beach? No, I I don't think so. I think I was a true reflection of their values personally, and saw the, my life through that prism. I do remember during the '60s the great conflict in the greatest generation, which I later came to greatest generation. One of the stories that I tell about the 60s is, imagine if you're a Marine who's gone through World War II. You dropped out of school in Detroit at the age of 17 and joined the Marine Corps. And then you went to Iwo Jima and you went to Peleliu and you went to Okinawa and you came home. And you married the girl down the street and you went to work for the Ford Motor Company on the line and you caught the good wave. You got the good benefits, the good wages, mm -hmm. you got the good pension program, and by the mid-1950s, you bought a house. That was unheard of in your family. And you had two children, a boy and a girl, and they had more things than you ever could have imagined mm -hmm. as a youngster. And before too long, 
you bought a little fishing cabin in the Upper Peninsula somewhere, and you got a boat to go with it, and you'd spend your weekends coming up here. And then one day in 1967, you come home for supper, as we called it, and it's 5.30 and it's time to watch Walter Cronkite or Chet Huntley and David Berkeley. You still have a crew cut. Put your lunchbox down in the kitchen, sit down at the kitchen table, and you look up and your daughter is sitting there with hair on her legs because it's not, it's, <laughs> if you want to be liberated, you don't have to share, shave your legs anymore. <laughs> she's not wearing a brassiere or any other undergarments. <laughs> and she's got a boyfriend who's wearing his sunglasses inside and seems not to have shampooed or cut his hair in the last four years. And his name is Zeke. And he plays in a heavy metal band. And she said, Daddy, Zeke and I are going to move in together, but don't worry about it, I'm on the pill. <laughs> now he looks to his son, who's sitting across the table, for some help. And his son is sitting there with an American flag with a swastika over it, with America spelled with a K. And he said, Dad, I'm not going to fight no war in Vietnam. I'm headed for Canada. I'm going to burn my draft card. This old Marine turns around to his wife, looking for some kind of assistance. She's got her hands on her hips behind him, and she says, hey, big guy, how come I'm the only one who does the dishes around here? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much a portrait of what was going on in a lot of households in America. Now, having said that, they all got through it together somehow. Right. And the wounds were healed later. And they were, able to, they were able to find their way back together as families, and they all learned from one another. And that's part of the resilience strength of this country, I believe. 1968, is there, uh, that's a cataclysmic year in your book, Boom, which is your most recent book. Any, is, have we had our 1968 in the 21st century? I mean, is, are, are we headed for it? Um, We've not had a 1968 because ever, the wheels completely came off the system. Uh, people, in a lot of ways, have, I suppose, modified their memories of that time. A lot of people on the left have said that was the most glorious year of my life. A lot of people on the right have said it was their worst year in the history of the country. It was mostly a time of enormous turbulence in which all that we believed in was tested. It began with Lyndon Johnson saying, we're turning the corner in Vietnam and the American economy is strong. Within a month, he'd been successfully challenged by Gene McCarthy in New Hampshire. and He was forced to go on, public, on national television and announce he would not be a candidate for re-election, for renomination. This proud Texan who had won in a landslide just four years earlier as he, after he had succeeded John Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy gets into the race. Dr. King, who had led nothing less than a moral crusade in the South and had gotten the Civil Rights Act passed and now turned himself to economic opportunity and was trying to hold off very radical and violent elements within the Civil Rights Movement, goes to Memphis to stand with the striking sanitation workers. He is murdered in cold blood on a hotel, on a motel balcony. And America goes up in the inner cities, in Detroit, Washington, D.C. almost burned down, in Los Angeles, all across the north, all across this country, the inner city went up, with the exception of Indianapolis, where Bobby Kennedy had arrived that night, made the announcement, and talked passionately but coolly about how violence is not the answer, and kept that city intact. And then Bobby Kennedy wins the California primary the first Tuesday in June, thanks his supporters, flashes the peace sign and says, on to Chicago, steps into a hotel kitchen corridor, and he's shot at point blank range by a deranged young Palestinian who believed that he was not sympathetic to the goals of the Arabs in the Middle East. And Bobby Kennedy dies within 24 hours. This is June of 1968. By the end of the year, 15,000 young Americans died in Vietnam. We had riots in the streets of Chicago at the Democratic Convention. 
at a three-way race for president that year. Richard Nixon, who had taken himself out of politics in 1962, was back in with a new strategy to make the Republican Party the dominant party of the American South and to play what he called the silent majority, portray himself as the statesman with a plan to end the war in Vietnam. And Hubert Humphrey, the happy warrior, who had been the liberal conscience of the Democratic Party, was now stuck with the Lyndon Johnson war legacy, trying to remain loyal to his friend, but at the same time expressing his own doubts about the wisdom of our policies in Vietnam. And a third man was in the race, George Corley Wallace, the governor of Alabama, who came out of that state on a stream of hateful invective preaching the gospel of violence and bigotry and attracted a considerable following. And then that year, in November, Richard Nixon was elected, but just barely, and promised to bring the country together, but instead gave us Watergate and six more years of Vietnam. But we got through it. We managed to heal the wounds over a long period of time, to learn some lessons, from all that we'd gone through. There were fissures everywhere. A lot of people look back in the 60s and think, really, it was represented by a young hippie girl dancing in Golden Gate Park to the strains of James Taylor in the background while a guy's off to the side hitting on a bong, getting completely stoned. But there were young men every day going down to enlistment offices and raising their hand and volunteering to go to Vietnam as well as answering the draft. Construction workers wearing hard hats who didn't have the advantage of a college education or the deferment that came with it were reporting for work every day. People were still going to church on Sundays and merchants were opening their doors and trying to keep America moving in the same direction. So that was a traumatic time. And I don't think we've had anything quite like that in 2000, in the 21st century. Uh, as desperate as the attacks of 9-11 were, and we're still playing out the consequences of that. But that was a very substantial, profound challenge to the fabric of American life. Mm -hmm. Talk about Watergate for a moment, because I know some of the pe many people in the audience have a fascination with that. And you were, were you at the White House then? I was at the White House you, during Watergate. You moved there in 72? To I got there in 73, the summer of the hearings. Um, well, Watergate sneaked up on us in a way. Um, and it, um, they might have gotten away with it, although it's hard to believe it if it hadn't been for Carl and, and Bob, um, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, uh, two young, new kinds of reporters who really believed in shoe leather uh, and weren't part of the Washington Press Institution going to lunch every day and hanging out with the power brokers. So when I got to the White House in the summer of that year, there was a general belief that now that the hearings were over and that Haldeman and, and Ehrlichman were going to go to jail, that the president probably had dodged a big bullet. And uh, it was going to be probably OK. Here's an amusing story. One of the first things that I covered in August of 1973 was a press conference given by Spiro Agnew, who was said to be under investigation by the FBI for corruption during his days as governor of Maryland. And he went out and he gave a bravura performance, answered all the questions. Everybody came back and said, isn't it refreshing that we've got at least one public official <laughs> who's willing to stand up and answer the questions? And the next day, I went over to see the attorney general, Elliot Richardson, and I said, I so, saw Vice President yesterday and covering the White House. Are we through the worst of it, Mr. Attorney General? Knock on wood, Mr. Brokaw, we're through the worst of it. He later told me that he had in his desk the indictment that they were about to prepare for the Vice President of the United States, <laughs> who had been stealing everything except the toilet paper in any public party where he had been. And then it just began to unfold day after day after day. You know, we, we went through the Six-Day War in the fall of 1973. 
um, you would go with the president uh, to various public occasions. I remember going to the Southern Governor, Governor's Conference in September, late September. He said there, the worst of it has passed. He went to Disney World and he said, uh, the country deserves to know whether the president is a crook. I'm not a crook. Um, he was so beleaguered and so determined to show that he was uh, not what a lot of people thought that he was, that he decided to go out to his home in California and not take government aircraft. And so he got on a United flight. Can you imagine this? The president of five Secret Service agents got on a United flight without telling anyone. And we knew that he was trying to dodge the press as much as anything. And so I flew through the night on another red-eye flight so I could be outside his San Clemente gates the next day, which I knew would not please his staff at all, reporting on where he was and, and, and what he was up to. And there was this long kind of drip, drip, drip water torture that the country was put through. It was a real constitutional crisis. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. I didn't know whether we'd survive. There was a time when I didn't know whether Richard Nixon would call out the troops hmm. to defend the White House. And then, of course, by the summer of 1974, he was withholding the tapes, and the Supreme Court ruled that he had to give them up. And within 48 hours, a smoking gun appeared, as we all suspected it had been there all along, and it was. And it was, in many ways, a surreal week. I got home one night about midnight, and Meredith had left out some cold chicken. And I was reading the transcripts of the tapes. And she leaned over me and said, honey, those are historic documents, and you've now got chicken grease all over the tapes. <laughs> And I went on the air the next day, and then I went down to the White House when Richard Nixon was going to be making that <clears throat> tortured farewell to the staff in the White House. And uh, I have these odd memories of Tom Gerald, the White House correspondent, had gone on vacation just before the tapes came out, before the Supreme Court decision. And he'd run into some shopping center in Maryland where he lived to get a haircut because he was going to have to go on the air. And I'm, I'm here to tell you it was the worst haircut I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> and we were standing in the East Room of the White House and nobody in the press corps was saying anything about Gerald's haircut, waiting for the president when Ron Ziegler, whose life is now over in effect because he's defended the president and then comes bustling into the East Room, stops, wheels around and says, Gerald, that's the worst haircut I've ever seen. <laughs> And I watched the president walk out, escorted by Gerald Ford, throw up his arms in that victory salute that he thought would irritate everybody and fly off. And within 24 hours, Gerald Ford had said, our long national nightmare is over. And the country moved on. Hmm. Um, what, what, I watched, you know, before you came, I watched some of the video on, on the internet about the 9-11 coverage you did. You write poignantly about that in your autobiography, A Long Way From Home, standing in your apartment, and being able to look at the skyline. Can you talk to us about that? Uh, yeah, that was the single hardest day, and it was more than a day, but that, that one day um, was extremely difficult. Um, and for all the obvious emotional reasons, but also as a professional journalist with all of you out there looking in saying, help me, I need to know what's going on. And we didn't know. There had been no preparation for that. There was no active body of intelligence that we could turn to and say, this is where they came from and, and what happened. It was unexpected. Uh, at one point, early in the morning hours, uh, Sometime, I believe, before the towers went down, I looked into the camera and said, this is war. And there had been no declaration of that yet. I said, this is the most serious attack on the United States since the War of 1812. Hawaii was not yet a state when Pearl Harbor happened. This will change us. And then a few minutes later, I was watching the towers, and I grew up around construction. 
And I looked into the camera and I said, I hesitate to say this, but those towers are going to have to come down at some point because there's been so much structural damage. And then I thought, don't do that. Don't say that. That's going too far. And four minutes later, they came down. Uh, I didn't anticipate that they were going to come down that day. I can't say that. And with every passing 15 minutes, there was more trauma to report, more uncertainty about what was going on. And if you do what I do, and I'm a pretty emotional guy, you, you kind of operate on two different planes. You try to be as professional as you can, get the information right, say it in a coherent way so people can understand what's going on, but you're always kind of taking your own temperature. Am I okay? Am I going to get through this? Do I make sense? And I kept worrying that I was going to break down because the stories, one after another, mm -hmm. were more poignant. And I was doing fine until about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, a guy called in, he'd been in Tower 2, and he was on the phone with us. And I said, give me a word picture. What happened to you when the building was hit? He said, I rushed out to the elevator bank. They weren't working. And he said, I saw the fire escape stairs. And I ran to that door, and I turned around, and I have four co-workers who are confined to wheelchairs. And there was nothing I could do for them. And he started to cry. And I'm always especially touched by people who are confined to wheelchairs because I'm an active outdoorsman. And they always show the kind of courage I doubt that I would have. And I thought, this is so cruel, the last moments of their life after all that they've been through, that this building was breaking up around them and they didn't have a chance. I went home late that night, as I described in the book, I looked out our library window and I could see the glow in the south of the continuing burning and I had a big drink at about two o'clock in the morning and it went straight through me. It had no impact whatsoever. Adrenaline is a very strong drug it turns out and I thought maybe I'll have another one. <laughs> and then I thought if I do that I may not be in shape to, to get through it. So. The next morning, I woke up after about five hours of sleep, completely electrified, ready to jump out of bed. And the phone rang, and it was my assistant. And a very dear friend of mine is a New Yorker writer by the name of Calvin Trillin, Bud Trillin. And his wife had been in the hospital awaiting a heart transplant. And she died the night before. And it was like family. And it was cathartic for me. I cried for 45 minutes. My wife was out of Montana at the time. I just sat in my bedroom and cried. And it was, um, in a way, a relief valve. And then I jumped in the shower and rushed back to work. And the rest of it's kind of a blur, frankly. I mean, I don't remember details hour by hour by hour. We were just on the air constantly trying to keep track of this. About six weeks later, I went back and looked at my calendar um, to see where I had been before 9-11 happened. 9-11 happened on a Tuesday. And it turns out that on the preceding Friday, I had been in Washington as a guest of Mrs. Bush at her first national authors celebration, that she had all the authors that she enjoyed and others come. And I was one of the featured readers on Friday night uh, at the Library of Congress, a black tie audience of the diplomatic corps and the leaders of Congress with David McCullough. It was a hugely important moment for me, personally. Uh, I felt so privileged to be there uh, as one of the two readers, and I was reading from The Greatest Generation. And then we had a wonderful party afterwards, and the next day I came back up to New York, and on Monday it was raining desperately. And we were supposed to, I was helping honor a young climber who was blind, who had climbed Mount Everest. You know Eric, uh, you know who he is? Mm -hmm. And we were going to have a breakfast for him at the top of the World Trade Center on Tuesday morning. But there was a problem with the schedule, so we had it in New York in Midtown on Monday night. And it was pouring rain. And I went down and introduced him, and it was a small gathering. And I'd completely forgotten about the schedule. And if we'd been at the World Trade Center in the 
cafeteria, none of us would have survived because no one there did. Hmm. And I later said to Mrs. Bush, um, you know, I remember being at the White House and then at the Library of Congress reading on the Friday before 9-11. And she said, yes, and earlier in the week we had a state dinner for the president of Mexico. Now remember, they'd only been in office since January. So she said, that's what I thought the presidency was all about. State dinner, author's luncheon, and then she said then it was 9-11. So it was a very traumatic time, obviously, for the country. I'm not sure that we took full advantage of the spirit that existed in the weeks and months after 9-11. I thought there was a rare opportunity for both parties, frankly, to come together and say that we're now joined in common enterprise here. Some sacrifices will be required of all of us. And we'll have to find a way out of this. Yeah, you've talked about that, about the <clears throat> lack of sacrifice that's been asked today of families in relation to the books you've written. Um, but I, have a, I just have one thing, because I was thinking and maybe the audience is interested. When you're sitting there and information is coming into your head and you're on camera speaking to 16, 20, how many people, millions of people, do you know? I, uh, that night, we did take, they, they didn't do ratings that night because everybody agreed to suspend them, but we had a way of finding out. And um, the three networks, um, I don't want to go into the specific numbers because it's un, kind of unfair, but the three networks had close to 100 million people watching them. Uh, NBC had a few more than the other two did. Um, <laughs> Well, that's as far as I want to go. Thank you. That that well because of because well there of are a you. lot of people watching and, and you're aware of that but you don't you don't sit down in the chair and say oh my God there's this mass of people out there watching me. Well no that's my question what are you thinking because you're you, you're looking and you're saying you know this is war and I'm thinking you've been on the beach at D Day you've interviewed these wet veterans all that stuff is informing your internal. You have compass. one thought and that is get it right. I'm honestly, I'm not overstating it. It's, it's just, please, let me get it right. And I'm, I'm double questioning everybody who brings anything to me. They say something in my ear, I'm saying, are you sure? They say, we're gonna have an opportunity to interview. I said, that's not relevant, let's not go there. So there's this dialogue that goes on that you don't hear when other reports are on the air. I did say later, and Dan and Peter and I talked about it as well, and we had a common reaction to it that had not occurred to us until much later. Um, I was at that time, I wish I still were, I was 61, and um, <laughs> it, had, it took everything I knew as a journalist, and as a father, and as a citizen, and as a human being to get through that day. Everything I knew. I had familiarity with the Middle East. I knew the Twin Trade Center towers. I had written about America going through other traumas before. I knew what families were going through because I'd been a father. I was a father, and I could only imagine what it was like to have a mother or a father or a child working in one of those buildings. And what I tried to do uh, was to keep it contextual, keep perspective, as well as deliver the facts. And I dare say, and, I, uh, and I, I'm, I'm not being disingenuous about this, I thought it was a remarkable tribute to all the news outlets, that everybody stepped up and did a fantastic piece of work. And one of the advantages of having this wide screen that we now have is you've got a lot of different places that you can go. I'll tell you one uh, very quick story. I'm a friend of uh, Ted Turner's. I'm a big admirer of Ted's. Um, He's a great guy to know, because you never know what's going to happen next with him at any given moment. Um, but he's an absolute genius when it comes to uh, information and how it ought to be disseminated. He, after all, I invented cable news. And he had stepped away from CNN at that point, but he still has his penthouse apartment in the CNN headquarters in Atlanta. And Walter Isaacson was running CNN at the time. So he called, or Ted went down into the control room and looked up and there was CNN with uh, its coverage on the air, but there are a lot of channels that are part of the Turner Broadcast and TBS and all those other channels, movie channels and everything else. And uh, Walter said, I think we're doing pretty well. And Ted said, you're doing pretty well. Put everything, put the CNN feed on all of our channels. So TBS and everybody carried 
CNN, so no matter where you went uh, across their spectrum, you got the news. And that's the time when that's all you want in society. Mm -hmm. You just want information. You have this enormous thirst for it. Tell us about what, your thoughts on Greg Mortensen. On what? Greg Mortensen, Three Cups of Tea, the author of Three Cups. He's yeah. been here. Oh, he has yeah, been Yeah, he's been here? here twice. And he has a lot of fans here. And I know, I just want to tell the audience for a moment, when Greg, if you, if you, we want to bring Greg back because he's, I was just, I, he's well respected. But what people don't know is that he sent out a thousand letters fundraising to everybody. Uh, in media, entertainment, Hollywood, the only person to send him a check back was this guy right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, now, as wait, a wait, as Greg says, it was only for 25 bucks, but... It was 100. <laughs> no. It was 100 bucks. Um, he wrote to me, and I think maybe I'd been tipped by it, there's a, this is kind of a complicated, but in the end, kind of an amusing story. I think I'd been tipped by a mutual friend that I had played football against in South Dakota who was a member of the Lutheran Church where Greg worshipped in Minnesota. And then it turns out Greg had been coached by my old high school uh, football coach. So I think Don may have said to me, this guy is going to write to you. I, I vague, Don insists that that's the case. Anyhow, I read he was a climber. I read he'd been working in Afghanistan. I thought this is worthwhile, I sent him a check for $100. So I did. Now the book comes out, and he writes in the foreword, and continues to write in the foreword. <laughs> I asked a thousand celebrities, the only one who responded was Tom Brokaw, <laughs> who sent me $100. I have a daughter who's an emergency room physician in San Francisco. She was a Schweitzer fellow in the middle of Africa. She worked in Peshawar, Pakistan, when the Russians were in Afghanistan treating Afghan women she has treated uh, refugees in camps in Thailand, and she looks at me and said, that is an outrage. <laughs> you get all that attention for a hundred bucks, Dad. <laughs> That's two martinis and a hamburger in New York. Yeah, you get all that attention for. She's still furious about it. <laughs> He's the real deal. He's the real deal. He, he, and he probably knows more about winning hearts and minds than anybody else that we have in Afghanistan at the moment. And Mike Mullen, the chairman of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, an admiral came to me about a year ago and said, okay, my wife says, I've got to meet with Greg Mortensen. What do you think? And I said, I think it's a great idea. And so they invited Greg in to do a briefing for the, for the Joint Chiefs. And Mike told me later that he said it was one of the best briefings that we'd had about the culture and what people respond to in Afghanistan. Since then, I've worked with his family, and we've produced a videotape, and he just lifts me. Because if he's been here, you know, he, he doesn't have a natural stage presence. I mean, you know, he is what he is. I mean, he's a, he was a climber, and a, he's the son of Lutheran missionaries. Uh, went to the University of South Dakota, so we share an alma mater as well. And he is just determined to go do good work. And sometimes it's a strain on the family because he's gone for a long time. Foundation is now based in Bozeman, Montana. And it's totally thrilling for me to see that paperback book <laughs> as high as it is, not just because I get the credit for the 100 bucks, <laughs> but that, it's, that it stays there. And students now are required to read it at the Claremont Colleges and at Northwestern, I think, incoming freshmen. So that's a great tribute. You mentioned he was a climber, and I know that you love the outdoors and you love to fish, and you have a very good friend who's a climber. Um, what's that relationship like? How, we see you, most of us in the audience, see you as someone who's been on TV, but I know that you spend a lot of time running around outside. In, uh, yeah, I, I love the out, I, um, The short story is that I grew up on the, on the prairie hard by the Missouri River, and my closest friends when I was growing up were Indians. Um, uh, Sylvan High Rock and Jerry One Feather and, and Billy Bad Moccasin and we'd hunt and trap and fish. And Elmer Ashes. Out. Elmer, was there an Elmer Ashes too? Elmer Ashes. You remember Elmer Ashes as well. And uh, uh, that was a big part of my life. Um, 
And then I got to be in college, and I thought, I want bright lights, big city. I, you know, I want to get out of the prairie. I want to get from out of these small towns where nothing is going on culturally, and I want to be in Los Angeles and New York and, and, and where things are happening. And, and I got there. And after I'd been there for a while, I loved it, but I missed the open spaces. So uh, Meredith and I started going back. First in California, we went into the mountains doing backpacking trips, just the two of us. I think it had a little something to do with getting away with kids who were two, four, and six at the time. <laughs> um, my mother and father would love to come out and stay with them. And then we moved to New York, we'd go to Colorado, and we'd take the whole family now on, on camping trips up in the mountains, or we'd get a place and then go off on day hikes, and then we started doing uh, Montana. And I, I got intrigued by the climbing culture, and I had a friend by the name of Rick Ridgway, who was the first American to climb K2. And he came back and I put him on the Today Show. It was the last time any mountain climbers were on the Today Show. I put every one of them that came along on. <laughs> and, um, and Rick said to me, uh, why don't you come out to uh, Jackson Hole this summer? And Yvonne Chouinard, who is you know, a legendary climber, he is the combination of uh, Ted Williams, Michael Jordan, and uh, Jack Nicklaus uh, as a climber. And, uh, and we'll teach you how to climb. And I thought, God, I just can't resist doing that. I had no idea what I was getting into. And I went out there, and I was in very good shape. I was running a lot and working out. And I kind of showed up like this rube saying, OK, what do I do? And Doug has had his own Chouinard experience, so he knows what this is like. And, and Yvonne said, well, you're in pretty good shape. That's pretty good shape. So OK, we'll, we'll go climbing tomorrow. And uh, they, <clears throat> we uh, paddled across the lake. They borrowed a pair of climbing shoes for me. And I went out to something called Baxter's Pinnacle in, in uh, Jackson Hole uh, as part of the Exum School. And they said, do whatever we do. Just pay attention to what we do and do it. So I climbed this pretty severe climb. It was a 5'7 climb. And I, I, was, I was able to do it by kind of mimicking what they were doing. And then they got to the top. And we got to the backside. And, and uh, Yvonne said to Rick, why don't you go do free climb? That little spire up there I put in this thing. And, Rick said, mm, yeah, maybe I'll get roped up. And he puts a rope around him. He fell 60 feet past me. And what did I know? And I turned to Chenard and I said, how often does that happen? <laughs> <laughs> and Yvonne said, that's the worst fall I've ever seen anybody survive. <laughs> and I thought, I'm putting my hand, myself in their hands. Two days later, we are going to climb the Grand. And, uh, um, in the Teton Range. And we're going to climb not the easy route, but we're going to climb the direct exit route, one of the 50 classic climbs in America. So they were going off to, on the way up, they went off to make another little climb. I went on my own, got up to the hut, and I'm there thinking, is this a good idea? Should I be doing this? And the, uh, a bunch of 20 year old guys who were in the advanced climbing class, they'd been in training for three weeks, came up with their guide. They were going to do the easy route. And they said to their guide, why can't we do the direct Exum route? And he said loud enough for me to hear, you're not ready yet. I'm doing it after eight hours. <laughs> it worked. Uh, and then we went off and did a lot of things. We went to South America. We climbed the Cows Glacier on, on Whitney. And we, we went ski mountaineering. And Yvonne is my spiritual brother in a lot of ways. He's very important to me. We're extremely close friends. And uh, he's been hugely influential in how I lead my life, you know, because he constantly disapproves of anything that is not raw and wild and a little bit dangerous. And, uh, <laughs> and I think about him a lot. And we've done a lot of things together. One time, we were in the back country above Yellowstone in the middle of the winter doing a winter climb. And I had just gotten off the plane from New York four days before, no acclimation whatsoever. We just plunged in. And by the third day, I am exhausted. I'm just worn out. And we're now getting ready to ski out. And they spot this peak that had been not climbed all winter and it had beautiful virgin snow. And they said, let's go climb that. And I said, I'm going to pass. And Yvonne said, no, come on. And I said, OK, I got a virus. He said, no, come on. I said. <laughs> I've got AIDS. I'm not going to do it. I'll, I was making up anything that would work at that point. 
I'm going to die right here. So they went off and did it, and, and uh, we did it. <laughs> One of the stories is that we were climbing uh, a, a glacier climb in uh, Mount Rainier in, in Washington, and I had never ice climbed before at that point. I had what we called the two-minute Chouinard lesson on crampon use and, uh, before we began. And so I was doing fine. It was the second day, and we came to a very precipitous, uh, very steep, like, 80 degree drop and it was all black ice and we had to get across it to get to the route to continue on. And if you made one tiny misstep, you were 4,000 feet down the mountain. So I turned to Yvonne and I said, we rope up here, right? He said, are you kidding? He said, if you go, we all go. You've got to get there on your own. I'm, I think you can still find my crampon marks in that ice. I was in so deep as I went across, I can't tell you. Yeah, he's really an inspiration. I mean, right. if, you don't, if you folks don't know his, uh, his mission at Patagonia, he, I, I, the re one, of the reason, one of the reasons that we met is that I, I went on a, to South America with Yvonne Chouinard for Men's Journal magazine. And much, he, you know, I'm, I, w I showed up like a rube, and I said, I'm going to bring all this gear, this cups and pots and pans and I said do you want me to bring you anything because I can... he said no I don't use a sleeping bag and I said really <laughs> he goes I said how about a no I don't use a tent and I said what about a frying pan no we don't need a frying pan we had nothing we took no food and no gear and I said what about food Yvonne it's about three weeks and we're at the tip of he goes don't worry it'll show up and uh <laughs> and it did no it's and listen he... we were we were at the foot of Mount Moran one time and we were going to field test some new Patagonia gear. So we had numbers in the back, and we didn't have sleeping bags. He, he said, we're going to go real light and just flash them out tomorrow morning. And we bought one submarine sandwich for the two of us. And we went in at 6 o'clock at night. We were going to climb all the next day. And he said, we just want to go real light. So <laughs> we didn't have sleeping bags. So you know, I had my gear on, and, I, and nighttime came, and I crawled down and snuggled up against a log. And, a cold front went through, and it got down to about 35 degrees that night. And at 5 o'clock in the morning, I was over kicking him. And I was so angry at him, saying, what the hell were you thinking? You were no sleeping bag. And he kind of rolled over and said, yeah, it got a little colder than I thought it was going to. <laughs> and we ended up climbing this route on Mount Moran. And it went very well, and I'd been doing a lot of it at that point. And he finally said about three-quarters of the way up, hey, let's drop the ropes. You can free climb this. So we climbed it free all the re rest of the way up. And I get to the top, and there are two guys from town who live in Jackson Hole. They're completely roped up. And then Yvonne said, well, we don't have time to hang around. We're going to go back down. We start free climbing back down. And he, he's so skilled. He's way ahead of me at this point. I'm making my way down this cliff, no ropes. And finally, these guys have turned completely ghostly white, and their eyes have gotten about this big, and they kind of crabbed their way over to me, and they said, we're not going to be responsible for watching the anchor of Nightly News die on this mountain." <laughs> they said, you have to put this rope on. <laughs> we're not going to allow you to go on. We're going to hold you here if necessary. <laughs> so we climbed down together, and then we had a whole other epic day. <laughs> Before we, let's, let's, uh, before we go to the questions, I just have one more thing. Any th uh, thoughts? Yeah, we've talked, and you said something about getting along, about <clears throat> much like you did with the World War II stories, about today. But you, you, get, you gave a speech recently, right? I think that was your message, right? We're here in this room, and we need to get along. What did you mean by that? And who, who are you speaking to? Well, I think these are, uh, I, think, I think this is a passage for America. Um, this is not just a routine economic downturn. I think this is a time to take stock, uh, to reevaluate where we've been, where, where we are, and where we want to go from here. And we ought to be thinking more boldly than I believe that we are. Um, everyone wonders when the recession's going to end, uh, when the downturn's going to come to an, a close. And it does seem that we're bottomed out how long uh, we're going to be at the bottom before a real turn-up begins. You can't say yet. Warren Buffett, in his infinite wisdom, has got the best line that I know. About six months ago, he was asked about, well, Warren, when's the recession going to end? And he said, you know, I don't know. He said, it still takes nine months for a woman to make a baby. 
you can get nine women pregnant on the same day and they're not going to have a baby in 30 days. And there's a kind of wisdom in that, <laughs> frankly. Um, Why nine? So, <laughs> so what I've learned as I've gone around the country is that for all the food fights that go on in Washington, D.C., between, between the two parties and the congressional leaders and the White House and the Hill, for all the clatter that you hear on the cable channels from left to right and back again, as I go around the country, and I've been all over America in the last two years, I did a documentary that took me on Highway 50 from the eastern shore of Maryland all the way to Sacramento. I did a big project on baby boomers that we began at the University of Michigan with the class of the earlier class of 1972. Um, and what I found is that I went out into the fabric of this country, places like Traverse City or Emporia, Kansas, or East St. Louis, or little towns in Ohio that have been hit hard by manufacturing shutdowns, is that there was a recognition on the part of everyone that we all got in this together, and we're only going to get out of it if we work together. And in community after community, in state after state, people didn't get up in the morning and put on a red state or a blue state or a Tea Party pin or a Republican pin or a Democratic pin. They got together at service clubs or in coffee shops or in city halls or car dealerships and said, what's best for the whole community? How do we move on? What is it we have to do? And when other parts of the community took a harder hit than some, people would kind of respond and help them out with temporary jobs or food banks. So there was a learning lesson here, I think, from the ground up that has not reached the top yet. And in my own, uh, I suppose, at this stage of my life as a grandfather, looking at my granddaughters and wondering what kind of a life they ha they'll have and how people will look back on this time, I'd like to see more bold ideas. I'd like to see a much greater investment in education, especially in science education. <laughs> I would really like to see uh, an elevation of the idea of public service. And one of the ways that I want to do that, I've been thinking about this a lot, and I've been trying it out. I began at the Naval Academy. I gave the Forrestal Lecture earlier this year. I think it's worth exploring the idea of having, in this country, six public service academies modeled kind of on the military academies, but nothing quite as full-blown as they are. And here's my plan. You have public service academies that run two to three years for a course, and you distribute them around the country geographically at land-grant colleges. Michigan State is a perfect example of that. Cornell is a land-grant college in the Northeast. Texas A&M in the Southwest. And that three-year course has a full range of opportunities and a curriculum for young uh, graduates of medical school. They go for postgraduate work in third world medicine. Young political scientists go and they concentrate on conflict resolution. Everyone learns an exotic language, Arabic or Pashtun or one of the languages in the hotspots in the world. You have people who have computer skills, for example, who develop new software for teaching English or other languages in remote villages in Afghanistan, where Doug has spent a lot of time, and so have I. You have other technicians who develop very portable devices so you can go into those remote areas and with a simple generator and a small dish, you can download the kind of information that the villagers that we see when we go out there need about simple agriculture and nutrition and simple medical needs and, and taking care of themselves. And you do all of this in a public-private partnership. The government underwrites some of it but major corporations in America underwrite it as well. You have a Johnson & Johnson Fellow in third world medicine. You have a Caterpillar Fellow in road construction in undeveloped parts of Afghanistan or the subcontinent. 
you have a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation fellow using the enormous body of work that they have been able to develop to learn how to go into the most remote parts of Africa and detect, or in India, and to detect epidemics and cut them off before they get out of hand. At the end, and I call this the diplomatic special forces or the Peace Corps Plus, think about the resource that these young people would be for this country after they finish a three-year stint or a four-year stint in that kind of public service. They would come back to America and maybe go to work for Caterpillar with the kinds of skills that Caterpillar will require in this global economy, or Johnson & Johnson, or GE in developing water systems and, and small uh, power generators around the world. I think we can lift this generation and engage this country in a way that it needs to be engaged uh, around the world because, frankly, we're losing the fight. We're not winning the hearts and minds. In New York, that young man who parked what turned out to be, thank God, a clumsy car bomb in Times Square, he didn't come out of some poor village in the remote corners of Afghanistan or Iraq. He was a child of wealth and privilege, and he was trained in Pakistan, a country that is supposed to be our ally. So we have to think out of the box. We have to think of new ways that we're going to be dealing with turning this Islamic rage down and getting it redirected so that those people who are in the Muslim world know that they can have hope beyond putting a belt of explosives around themselves, men or women, getting in a car or walking into a mosque or walking into an American aid station and detonating it. Because so far what we've tried has not worked. And so I would like to see a big, bold idea like public service elevated to a new level. And it doesn't have to be just that part of the world. Take Haiti or Katrina. Our first responders now are the 82nd Airborne or a military unit. That's not what they're trained to do, or, or is, nor is it what we should expect of them. They're under strain as it is, fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and in the jungles of Colombia and the Philippines. We need a whole other force because these events are going to be more cataclysmic all the time. There are more of us living on a smaller planet, and when something happens, the consequences are instantly much wider than they would have been, say, 50 years ago when there was a much smaller population base. So, end of my sermon, if that's what I think. <clears throat> Thank you. If we could bring up the house lights. Thank you. And if you could line up. At, we have rovers here. Raise your hand. We'll bring a microphone to you. I'll point and you ask. Let's go to the right side first. Just put a question mark at the end of your statement if you'd like to do that. Isn't it? Yeah, we prefer questions. Here's yes, sir. Right go ahead. Here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for bringing, reminding us about uh, the greatest and I think most humble generation. Of all the uh, people currently active in American politics, could you share with us the one or two for whom you have the highest and warmest regard and why? Um, let me give you some historic perspective, uh, because it has to do with the native son of yours, uh, who's no longer with us. Some of you in this room probably voted for Phil Hart at some point in your lives. I thought Phil Hart was the quintessential great statesman as a senator. He had such humanity about him, and he didn't need the job. He came from a family of wealth and privilege in the greater Detroit area, but he was so much the conscience of the Senate that they have named the, the most prestigious Senate office building after Phil Hart. My own personal experience with him, which uh, touched me deeply, and it was just a small moment. Phil Hart fought in World War II, and I'll tell you the end of that story in a moment. And I knew that about him. And he came back, and he could have gone to Detroit, and the family had an enormous fortune. He was married into the Briggs family, and he could have just 
led the life of luxury, but he became a United States senator and he became a powerful voice for an enlightened foreign policy. And in 1973, or four, I guess, he was dying of cancer. And he was such a revered figure that people longed to be around him. But he had such a gentle way, and he was not an egomaniacal senator by any means. And one night we were at one of those big dinners that they have in Washington, it was a White House correspondence dinner. And I was there uh, with Lee Iacocca, who was my guest. And I was having a very good time, and my career was going well, it was in the middle of Watergate. And I looked up and Phil Hart was kind of staring at me from across the table with a benign smile on his face, kind of enjoying my good time. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Proca, how old are you? I said, I'm 34, Mr. Senator Hart. And he said, that's just great. <laughs> and he died about six months later. And I always thought it was a great tribute to him that he extended that personal moment to me as almost no other senator would. They would have been over bending my ear about some bill that they were being passed or they would have been complaining about some coverage, but Phil Hart did not. Now, uh, to, to pick out uh, a senator uh, in either party or a, or a member of Congress is more difficult because it has been polarized. Um, the ones that I've liked over the years, I love Bob Dole when he was a Republican leader. I like Pat Moynihan when he was a Democratic leader. I thought Tom Daschle from my home state of South Dakota did a good job as a Democrat. He was a tough guy, but he could work across lines. I really thought one of the best senators the Democrats had is now working in the administration, and that's George Mitchell. And I don't think we get nearly as enough out of him as that we, as that we probably should. I will tell you is that I go around the country that the best public servants I find these days are mayors, and they're Republicans and Democrats alike. And those are good jobs because they're hands-on and the community responds and they've got real responsibility. There's a new Republican mayor of Dallas that I had dinner with last week and I was quite honestly deeply impressed by his kind of take on what was required and how they were gonna get it done and the community was prepared to work with him. On the other hand, we make it tough for political people these days. Um, you know, the country is divided up into all these niches, and we tend to see what we want from them through our own niche, the prism of special interest as I describe it. So when we send somebody to Washington, we don't see a kind of bigger picture or a whole person we mostly see what we want from them for our special interest. If we're a dairy farmer, we want continuing milk supports, for example. If we're a builder, we want tax relief for building. If we're in the energy business, we don't want cap and trade. We want something that's gonna work for us. And that's what I think we have to get beyond. And so much of that is driven by the big money in politics because people can command loyalty by writing checks for campaigns. And we need to get beyond that. And it's going to take some people who are going to be willing to sacrifice their careers. They're going to stand up and say, this is what I believe. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but this is the way I'm going to see my way through this term of office and try to move this country in a direction that I think we need to. It's not good right now. There's deadlock and everybody's responsible, again. You can't blame just one party or the other. Um, we'll see what happens in the fall. What, what has happened, that you can say with certainty is that the largest party in America right now, not the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, is the Independent Party. And it's not a party, it's a, it's a kind of an ill-formed movement. More people are registered as independents than are re registered as Republicans or Democrats. We have a poll out tonight that's showing that's only surging at the moment. Hmm. We have another, yes, Beth, go ahead. Mr. Brokaw, uh, Thank you for reminding us that we are resilient. I really needed that tonight, <laughs> and I hope we got one more in us. Uh, I was born in a little town called Geddes, South Dakota in 1930. You know where that is. I do. <laughs> and uh, uh, one of my uncles was a school teacher of yours at Yankton. I'm, I'm wondering if you remember him, George Bauer. What was his name? George Bauer. Oh, I do very well. He was a great man. He was. Uh, George Bauer was the, uh, 
He ran the study hall, so he had kind of general studies uh, background, and he also ran the swimming pool in the summertime. And I think my wife, who was a lifeguard at that swimming pool, still has a crush on him. He was movie star <laughs> handsome. <laughs> the last time I saw uh, Uncle Butts, we called him. Did you ever call him Butts? Did he have that nickname at the school? Pardon me? Butts. Uh, yes. Did, yes? Okay. Yeah. Well, the last time I saw Uncle Butts, I asked him about you. And uh, he said, I will describe Tom Brokaw in one word. He was industrious. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very... <laughs> I think that's a great compliment. Well, that's very nice. Let me... Can I tell you about Geddes High School? Did you go to school in Geddes? Yes, I certainly did. Are you going to tell us about the basketball court? Yes, the basketball <laughs> court. This is a true story. The basketball court was about the size of the stage, and it was on a stage. So when you played basketball and there was a fast break, you were likely to go into the fourth row right off the stage. And it had a large skylight and a lot of snow would go there in the winter time. And it would leak through the skylight, and there would be these enormous puddles in the middle of the stage. And I had a friend, an Indian friend of mine, by the name of Sylvan High Rock, and I flipped an indoor pass, I mean an inbound pass to him. He took off on a fast break, he started sliding from about there all the way to there, and they called him for traveling. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a question over on this side? That uh, Geddes School has been closed because they're not graduating enough people. I don't know whether you knew that or not. I was very sad to hear that. Oh, Geddes they're closing school. the school? They're closing the school because they don't meet the state requirement of graduating at least 10 people a year. <laughs> yes. Mr. Bro Mr. Brokaw, I thoroughly enjoyed your book, The Greatest Generation, and the book about the boomers. And thank you for signing the copy for my three children to pass on tonight. But I was wondering, do you have your subject matter for the next book that you'll be writing, if you are indeed going to write another book? Well, you're hearing some of the themes here tonight uh, that, I've, that I've been talking about this evening or the things that I'm going to put in my next book. And uh, I will give you the premise of it uh, a little more than it, well, it was last year in June. I was in Normandy for the 65th anniversary of D-Day, and President Obama had not been in office very long, and I was going to do an interview with him, but it can only be worked out if I would do it in Dresden, uh, which is the German city that was firebombed during World War II. It was known as the Florence of the Saxon Empire. It was a beautiful, architectural, uh, majestic place. And um, I, got, I got to Dresden. It had been behind the... Berlin Wall all those years, and it had just been liberated for a, a few years at this point. And he was going to go from there to Buchenwald, one of the most notorious of the death camps. And then he was going to go from Buchenwald to Normandy. And so I interviewed him at this uh, castle in uh, Dresden, and we talked about uh, what his hopes were for uh, this trip and what he had learned from his own grandparents about World War II and what the future of the German people may be. And then when we finished the interview, we were walking down across the grounds and I mentioned to him that I uh, had been in Berlin and I hadn't been there for a few years, but I was the only correspondent in the world the night that the wall came down with live capacity and it was really one of the best nights of my life, I said. And the president put his arm on my shoulder and said, oh, Tom, I remember that. I was in law school. Oh, my God. <laughs> he was in law school. And now he's the president? This is yesterday in my life. Um, and so I, went, I, I got on the plane and flew back to Normandy to meet my wife and, and some friends. Um, and I thought all the way back about all the changes that I had seen in my lifetime having been born in 1940. The world had been liberated by, from the clutches of Japanese imperialism and, and German fascism. The, the beginning of the nuclear age, the collapse of the Soviet Union peacefully, men landing on the moon, the cultural upheaval of the 60s, which we somehow survived, the civil rights movement in this country, which peacefully liberated all of us from the shackles of segregation. 
Now we have an African-American president who's going to Buchenwald with the chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, who had walked across the line the day the Berlin Wall came down. She had grown up in East Germany, and she's now the chancellor of that country. They're going to Buchenwald with Elie Wiesel to pay witness to all that had happened, and then on to Normandy, the greatest invasion in the history of mankind. And by the time I got to Normandy, I kind of was rattled by all these seismic changes. And I began to think about my granddaughters. What change are they going to be witness to? How will their world change? And how do we try to take advantage in this country of all the resources that we have and the capacity that we have to help them prepare for a better world? How do we provide a legacy for them that the greatest generation provided for us? So that's what the book is about, and it's not done yet. <laughs> Sounds great. Do we have a, a question up in the balcony? I don't want to ignore you folks up there, if anyone does. Speak a little louder, please, because I'm, I'm having trouble hearing some of the questions. So. Hi, Mr. Baroka. You, know, uh, you know a friend of mine who, um, who is an author who's written a book, and there's a movie coming out about his life, and who's also a climber who you spent significant time with. Uh, his name's Aaron Ralston. I'm wondering if you could tell about that situation. And, Aaron um, Ralston? Oh, do you, do, uh, a lot of you in this room may not remember who Aaron Ralston was. Aaron Ralston was another climber. He was highly educated at the Carnegie Institute in uh, Pittsburgh. He was an uh, engineering and uh, French and classical music uh, major and he became intrigued with climbing. And he lived in Aspen, and one day, without telling anyone where he was going, he drove to southern Utah and parked his pickup, and he walked into the canyons of Utah, and he did something called canyoneering in a slot canyon, very narrow canyon. And you lower yourself over different boulders, and you get down, and then at the end, there's a 900-foot cheer drop down to another passage that leads you out of there. And he was going to do this in a day. And as he was lowering himself over one of these boulders by himself, the boulder slipped off its pinch marks and trapped his arm. And there he was, by himself, with a burrito and less than a kilo of water, permanently pinned against this rock wall. This was Saturday. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. No one knows where he is. His mother is frantically doing detective work back in Denver, Colorado, getting the license number from his pickup by pleading with the New Mexico Department of Motor Vehicles to give it to her, getting the Aspen police to go to the bank and getting their credit card number so they can see where the last purchase was. Aaron is hallucinating. He has devised a sling of sorts so that he can have some support, and he throws it over with the rope that he had to rappel off over the boulder to give himself some relief from standing mostly on his tiptoes. And on Wednesday night, as nightfall comes, and it's cold, he thinks, tomorrow I die. And in the middle of the night, he had more hallucinations, dreams. And one of the dreams was holding a son on his lap, a little boy. Another dream was seeing his sister again. And he woke up on Thursday morning, having been there since Saturday, with a half a burrito and a kilo of water. And he was forced to drink his own urine for hydration during this time. And he had an epiphanous thought, I can amputate my arm and free myself. And he did. He used a crude Leatherman's tool, prepared the surgical table on top of the boulder, so to speak, got the tubing out of his camelback, which he was going to use to tie off his arm, got the rope prepared, and began to cut off his own arm. No anesthesia whatsoever. It was a harrowing enterprise. 
I'm back in New York when all this is going on working. At about 4 o'clock in the afternoon on that Thursday, a bulletin hits the wires that I didn't see immediately, but my daughter, the ER physician in San Francisco, sends me a quick email saying, climbers, they're nuts. <clears throat> and I looked down and I thought, this cannot be true. This is not possible. But it was true. And the next day, after he'd had his wound dressed, he came out, had a news conference, and then the rush began to who was going to get the Aaron Ralston story? Who was going to be able to tell it on television? And immodestly, I always thought I was best prepared to do that because I... <laughs> and uh, the courtship began, and he knew of my interest, and he knew about my friendship with Chenard, and he worked in a store where they sold Patagonia equipment and so on, and I said to him, I promise you two things. One is it will not be exploitation, that it will reflect the spiritual agony that you were going through, which he did, as well as the physical ordeal. And number two, I'll go back with you. I don't think Diane Sawyer is going to go down in that rock canyon and rappel <laughs> off. I will. <laughs> and we put it on the air, and it was an amazing story. And it had lots of different elements to it. And to her absolute credit, the night that it ran, the phone rang as soon as it was over, and it was Diane and Mike Nichols, her husband, saying, it's the best thing you've ever done, Tom. I couldn't have come close. And we have stayed in touch since then. And he went on to climb all of the 14ers in Colorado. Those are 14,000-foot peaks in the wintertime, solo with a prosthesis on his arm. He's got actually several of them that he changes them depending on where he, how he wants to use the ice axe. So it was an amazing story. Wow. Do we have, what time is it, Tom? It's 9.25. Well, <laughs> we're going to take one more quick one, and then we need to adjourn. Do we have the microphone? Go, go ahead. Which I'll one? be way in the back. Thank you for being so inspirational and entertaining. We can't hear you for some reason. Thank you for being so inspirational and entertaining this evening. You're everything I hoped for and more. Um, You're everything she hoped for. <laughs> we, we've got to work on your dreams a little more. <laughs> Well, I woke up every morning to the Today Show as a child, so um, it just continues. Um, you mentioned education, and I wondered, who was your favorite teacher and why? Who, who's his favorite teacher? Who was your favorite teacher and why? Favorite teacher. Oh, that's easy. Um, I, I was a beneficiary of an amazing man in South Dakota by the name of Bill Farber. Bill Farber grew up in Illinois in a family of intellectuals and graduated with a PhD from Northwestern, and, oh, from Wisconsin in political science, went to Northwestern as an undergraduate at the age of 22 and came to South Dakota in the middle of the Depression uh, and was paid $3,000 a year as a, as a professor and as the Department of Political Science. And he stayed in that job until he died about four years ago at the age of 97. And he was such an enormous force in the lives of so many of us that when he died, this professor of political science, all the flags in South Dakota flew at half staff for five days. He was a man of great insight, great passions about politics and public policy. He turned out a record number of Rhodes Scholars and governors and senators and federal judges. He had people all over Washington in the Federal Reserve or in the Defense Department in very senior positions. And he had the perfect perspective on me. I came out of high school as a real whiz kid and then went seriously off the rails for a couple of years. And I, uh, I mean seriously off the rails. But I thought I was getting away with it. At the end of my sophomore year, Bill called me over to his house for dinner. And we had a jolly time, and uh, we were talking about politics, and everything was going on. I was a little rotund guy. And I can remember him sitting in his Barco lounge, which was his favorite chair, clasping his hands across. He says, 
Well, young Thomas, I have an idea for you. And I said, what's that, Dr. Farber? I was really flattered that he was been thinking about what I should be doing. He said, my idea is that you get the hell out of here. He said, I want you to go leave school until you get all the wine, women, and song out of your system. Because you're not doing us any good, you're not doing your family any good, and you're your enormous disappointment to your friends. And I thought that was kind of a ticket to party hardy for the rest of my lives. I did go away, and I didn't get really a course correction until the woman to whom I am now married intervened pretty sternly and said, you're not fooling anyone, and we don't understand what's going on with you. And I, I then began the course correction. I went back to Farber after six months. I left in the fall of my junior year, and I came back for the second semester of my junior year, and I said, okay, I get it. And he said, here is your class schedule, and here's your grade point expectation. And if you're a tenth of a point below it, I'm going to be all over you. And um, we were always fast friends, and he really saw, I think, in me some potential that I was frittering away, and it, and it angered him. Um, and then I was getting married that summer to the girl who had intervened, and one job had fallen through, and there was a possibility of a job in Omaha, and so I saw Bill on the campus, and he said, so what's going, do you have a job? And I said, I don't, but I, I hear there may be one in Omaha. And he said, come with me. So I walked with him over to his house, and he handed me the keys to his car, and he said, we're going to Omaha. You're driving. He said, the Joslin Art Museum, I can spend the afternoon. You go find that job. And we drove down to Omaha, and I got the job. And it was a huge turning point in my life. Now, he always had perspective as well. Because after I got to a certain level of success, he would always give the address to incoming freshmen at the University of South Dakota. And he would come out onto a stage like this and it would be filled with a thousand freshmen. And he would bounce out on his toes and say, my God, the possibilities. That was one of his famous phrases. My God, the possibilities. If Tom Brokaw can make it, any of you can make it. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Doug. Thank you.